everybody. Welcome. I'm Ben Paul, the director of the Free Market Institute here at Texas Tech University. Welcome to our final public lecture for this academic year. Uh, we'll be back in September with three more in the fall. Announcements to come out later. For tonight, I'm very pleased to be able to introduce to you Dr. Edward Stringham. He is the Shelby Coleman. <laughs> he is the Shelby Cullum Davis Professor of American Business and Economic Enterprise at Trinity College in Hartford. He earned his PhD in Economics at George Mason University. Prior to joining Trinity College, he was a professor at San, San Jose State University, uh, Fayetteville University, and he spent one year here at Texas Tech as a member of the faculty of the Rawls College. Uh, he also served as the president of the American Institute for Economic Research, where he made the Institute an early leader in the voice against lockdowns during the COVID pandemic. And maybe one of the accomplishments that I most admire from him is he is one of the architects of the meeting that resulted in the Great Barrington Declaration uh, coming out during COVID. So Ed, many people are indebted to you for your work on that. He is also quite the scholar. He is the editor of the Journal of Private Enterprise two books, and the author of more than 75 journal articles and policy studies. Uh, his work has been discussed in more than 100 broadcast stations, including CBS, CNBC, CNN, Headline News, NPR, and MTV. That must have been the alcohol stuff. Yeah. Uh, he has also appeared on BBC World, Bloomberg, CNBC, Fox, Fox Business, TV Ameritrade, Television, Yahoo Finance, and a bunch of other stuff. His book, Private Governance, Creating Order in Economic and Social Life, is published by Oxford University Press, and that is what he is here to talk about with us tonight. Ed, welcome back to Texas Tech. Guns up. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor Powell. It's really an honor to be here. I love Lubbock, and I love Texas Tech and the Free Market Institute, so I'm just thrilled to be here. I'm going to be talking about the best book of all time, <laughs> Private Governance by Edward Stringham. And the main theme of the book is that everyday ordinary people, entrepreneurs, solve problems in ways much more effectively than the bureaucrats. Entrepreneurs, everyday people, solve problems much more effectively than the bureaucrats. So I'm going to be going through and talking about some examples where people think that the bureaucrats, the politicians, are the ones to solve the problem. And I'm going to be focusing on how, in reality, it's actually done privately rather than through the government. So a big question in society when everyone says, oh, we need, we need regulation, we need people overseeing markets, we need people in control of business, is they say, without the regulators, without all of these government officials, markets are going to result in all sorts of problems, including fraud. And what I'm going to do is give some examples from history and modern times to show that actually entrepreneurs are way more effective at this than most people assume. So in economic lingo, don't worry if you haven't heard this term, but there's this idea that there's a prisoner's dilemma all around us. The story says two prisoners get arrested, and if they both are quiet, they're better off, but they both have an incentive to cheat, they rat on each other, and they both end up worse off. And the theory is society is like this. Even though both people would be better off cooperating, each person wants to cheat the other person. And when everybody wants to cheat the other person, everybody is worse off. And according to this theory, that's when you need the regulator. You need 911? OK, I'm going to come in to save the problem. So we've got a situation where most people assume you need the government. But some economists, this is Oliver Lund said, said Actually, the theory assumes that government, as in courts, are going to operate in an informed, sophisticated, and low-cost way. Uh, but he goes on to say that that's not always the case. So I'm going to give you a couple um, uh, examples of this. So this is a true story. In February 5th, Friday, 2015, 
some hackers posing as officials from the central bank of uh, Bangladesh sent a note to the Federal Bank of New York, Reserve Bank of New York said, um, could you please just send us $951 million? And so the Federal Reserve Bank of New York is like, well, uh, okay. <laughs> so they start transferring this money to these two private accounts. One of them is in the Philippines, and uh, it was, had a typo. It was called the Malika Foundation. And so the routing bank, Deutsche Bank, said, mm, I don't know, something doesn't look right about this. And it turns out this is a Friday, and uh, apparently Friday in um, Bangladesh is on the weekend. So the Federal Reserve Bank of Bangladesh has no idea that this is even happening. And uh, Deutsche Bank says, we're going we're to put a stop to this. But only after $101 million was transferred out into these two private hackers' accounts. And the money was withdrawn and spent on casino chips. This is a true story. The reason I mention this is these are the largest financial institutions in the world. You call up, hey, 911, um, somebody stole my $100 million, please. Could you get it back for me? Um, no. <laughs> we don't know what to do. And I want to mention this because this is such a big problem even for these large organizations. What happens when an ordinary person, such as you, or a small business, is engaging with trade and you meet a hacker? There's, hint, not much that the 911 can do about it. So I'm going to give you one more example of a problem, and then I'm going to then talk about some private solutions. Uh, I knew this guy in um, his tech guy from the 90s in this company and he was so excited it was going to come out and he was going to make all this money and some hackers got in and he's like oh my goodness my whole life my whole business investment is called is it's going to be destroyed so what do you do? You need to call the government, right? 911? What seems to be the problem? Come over quickly, quickly. So they show up to his place, the police, and they said, all right, what happened? Some, some, somebody broke into my computer. they break in from? <laughs> from the internet? What's the internet? Bo -bo -bo. <laughs> it's a true story. <laughs> okay, so we got the Federal Reserve Bank of Bangladesh. You call the police, not much is going to happen. You've got this other case, 911, not much is going to happen. And I'm going to argue that this is actually pervasive in the world and I'm going to say that rather than people sitting around and doing nothing about it, there are private solutions. Here's another true story, but this one has a good answer, a good outcome. It's a true story. I was buying these ties on eBay, and I was so happy. They came in, first one's great, second one's great, third one's great, but the fourth one, 
was a paisley tie. It was the worst day of my life. A paisley tie does not have stripes, and I was just ruined. So immediately I called the cops. I said, 911, you gotta get that guy. He's sending me the wrong ties. I paid $40 for these ties, and one of them's wrong. And the cops were like, okay, we're here. We're on the scene, and we're gonna do that. Okay, most of the story's true, but the last part's not true. <laughs> what did I do? What did I, you know what I did. What did I actually do? One of the students here. Did I call the cops? Who did I call? Okay, that's a good solution. One option is the credit card company. That's a really good solution. And before you call them, there's somebody else you can call. The eBay Corporation, yeah! Private governance, private rules. The entrepreneurs are on the case already. So in the case of eBay, we can think about this as a store, but we can also think about this as a club that is helping bring together buyers and sellers to make sure commerce works properly. And so in my case, I don't even think they had to have a big review of it. They said, did the party respond? I said, no. And within minutes, I got my $10 back. Yeah! <laughs> I want to highlight that because the cost of having a trial in most countries is hundreds and hundreds of days. The cost of even just having a one hour conversation with a lawyer, hundreds of dollars. So you can't rely on the legal system. And so now we have a private club to make sure that both people are happy with the system. We've got the rating system, which you all use with Uber and Lyft and all these other websites, where you say, yes, this person is a good person. And in the very small cases that it doesn't work out, you get to call eBay. eBay is there to answer my call whenever I want. And then, every once in a while, you have a bigger problem. And that's where you get really upset at Ben Powell. This is my last story, true story about Ben Powell. Um, but he moved out of San Jose State. And then a year later, I moved out of San Jose State. I said, Ben, do you have any movers to recommend? Foolishly, I took his advice. So these people came over, like, oh, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> Don't worry about it. It'll be $1,300. It's fine. Don't worry about it. And then they got all my furniture, and like, $9,000. <laughs> so who do I call? American Express. So American Express was able to then come in and adjudicate my situation that Ben Powell got me into. <laughs> Don't take movie advice from Dr. Benjamin Powell. Cost me the kickback. All right, so I'm just going to show a couple of graphs and then I'll show you a couple of other historical examples to show that this is actually a very common situation that we can think about private parties coming in to solve problems economically, using the profit motive rather than the regulatory motive. So my professor, James Buchanan, uh, won the Nobel Prize in 86, and he had this idea, it was called the economic theory of clubs, and he said most things we think about the government doing and you assume everybody in society must do it together through the government. He said most things we can think about as a club good. And a club good is something that can be solved at a smaller level. So just because I have a problem, it doesn't mean the FBI is going to be there to help me. We can solve things on a much lower uh, level. He also had this idea where we can think about rules having costs and benefits, 
And we want to have not too many rules, but the right number of rules. So for those of you who have studied economics, we can just think about marginal cost of rules. If there's too many, they go up. Marginal benefits of rules can go down. And like everything in markets, private parties have an incentive to not do more of something than you want. Uh, you want to have an incentive to do the right amount of something that you want. And so I'm going to go through and just give you some small examples of private people for profit solving issues that we always assume the government must do. <laughs> so I was sending some money over the internet yesterday. And uh, <laughs> this is a joke. Um, there's just so much that can go wrong over the internet. And uh, the dollar value of these losses is usually much smaller than the cost of recovering them through the court system. And a great example of a private solution is our friends, Peter Thiel and Elon Musk. So they created PayPal in the late 1990s. And uh, it was originally sending money through the Palm Pilots, then through the emails. And they didn't know that there was going to be so much fraud. They were overwhelmed with the amount of fraud. And very similar to the examples I gave before, they were hit by these international crime syndicates where some people would get the stolen password, get control of the account, then they would sell that to somebody else who would then utilize that account. And so, and a lot of these people were international. And one of the people they figured out who's stealing from them was in Kyrgyzstan. And they, true story, again, they called up the FBI and the FBI office of San Jose and the FBI office of San Francisco had a dispute with each other. Okay, which one of us has jurisdiction over Kyrgyzstan? <laughs> Guess what? It didn't work. So instead of them just dealing with the losses, they said, let's program a predictive analytic system to see whether we think a transaction is legitimate or not. So they used the first commercial version of CAPTCHA, which we all know now. Have to click on something, make sure you're not a robot. And uh, then they would assign probabilities. This, by the way, your banks right now are doing that for you. As we speak, if there's a fraudulent charge on your card right now, it's going to be declined because they say no. You are listening to Edward Stringham's talk <laughs> on private governance. We know that you're not making this fraudulent charge. So each time you make a transaction, your bank assigns a probability to whether it's you or not. And every once in a while, they guess wrongly. You have to call them up and say, no, that was me. But in most cases, it works well because they want to make sure that transactions are financed as the way you want them to. and not finance the way the fraudster wants them to. So PayPal was very much of an innovator in these regards in early time. They solved the problem of fraud before fraud existed, before it occurred. In most cases, and this has happened to all of us, they'll just turn down a transaction. If they think that something is really a big deal, they will actually see, see, seize, or, you know, freeze your account. Uh, <laughs> just recently, I had, I, was, I never really had this happen, but, but I had a bunch of fraudulent card <coughs> charges on my American Express. And so I said, mm, no, I didn't make these charges. So they, they gave me the money back for half of them. And, uh, and they're like, oh, but you made those other, those other seven. So, so I live in Connecticut, and I called them back. And I said, 
Uh, you know, see that signature that says you're sending goods to Houston, Texas, to some very, very complicated name? <laughs> it's not me. That's not me. And I said, oh, right. You're right. Okay. So this is much more common than we realize, but we're paying for our bank to manage the risk of fraud on our behalf. I'm going to zoom back in time and talk about how it's not only common uh, today with our banks, it's been common throughout all of uh, history with financial markets, complicated markets. I'll then bring back a couple modern examples and then relate it to uh, some emerging technology associated with cryptocurrencies, blockchains. So 400 years ago, the first stock market was in Amsterdam, and the first major stock company, Deutsche Stock Company, was called the Dutch East India Company. And they actually financed Henry Hudson's voyage to New Amsterdam, which is now called New York City. So they were doing a lot of very interesting things at this time, but the government didn't really understand these markets. And there was very sophisticated financial transactions going on very early on. So things like a forward contract, an options contract, a short sell. I'll mention what these are briefly. But a short sell is you're basically betting that a stock is going to go down in value. A forward contract is when you make a transaction now and agree to settle three months from now. An options contract is when you pay somebody a premium for the option, but not the obligation, to engage in a transaction, if you want to. Very, very sophisticated contracts. And the government official said, mm, no. It's too complicated. We don't know why you're doing that. It's a form of gambling. So they outlawed it. So the stockbrokers said, all right, well, we're not supposed to do this. We're all going to go home. And there's never going to be a stock market again. No. No. The stockbroker said, we don't trust those government officials. They don't know what they're talking about. And we're going to engage in these transactions anyway. And they developed a very, very sophisticated form of markets. A hundred years later, in London, same exact story. It's very weird, two different cities, not too far from each other, but very different cities. They basically had the exact same thing happen, and uh, the stockbrokers were blamed. Businesses, this always happens, by the way. Businesses are always blamed when something bad happens. They're always like, that's your fault. Business, no, 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 I'm just doing this. No, you're bad. So in London, the stockbrokers were engaging in these contracts, these forward contracts. And the government officials said, no, it's bad. It's a form of gambling. You can't do that. And so they got kicked out of the Royal Exchange. So in London, the stockbroker said, OK, fine. We're never going to have the stock market developed ever again. No. They said, we're going to do it anyway. The private parties had better insight about financial markets than the regulators. And they said, we're going to trade anyway. And they ended up meeting in coffee houses, Garraway's coffee house, Jonathan's coffee house. And they started making more and more sophisticated transactions, even though the transactions were not enforceable in the courts of law. I'll just give a quick quote from Adam Smith, the first famous economist. And then I'll give a couple other examples. But he says this. He says, buying stocks by time, okay, these forward contracts, three-month contracts I've talked about, is prohibited by government. The law gives no redress for a sum above five pounds. But he says, in the same manner, all laws against gaming, against gambling, never hinder it. People buy stocks by time anyway. He says, yet, yeah, even though it's enforceable, all the great sums that are lost are punctually paid. So think about this. I've heard some kids these days 
are into gambling. Sometimes illegal gambling. How do you get your money if you make an illegal bet? Or whoever you're betting with. How do you make sure that you're going to get paid? Well, Adam Smith, the first famous economist, says people who gamble, people who gamble must keep their credit. Credit means trustworthiness. He says, else nobody will deal with them. It's quite the same for stock jobbing, trading in stocks. They who do not keep their credit will be turned out and in the language of Change Alley, so the stock is changed, be called lame duck. So that's actually the origin of the word, if you've heard this term, lame duck. They'd kick you out of the coffee house and you'd have to waddle out of the coffee house. If you want to be a good member, you have to be reliable. And so he says, why? It's reducible to self-interest. That general principle which regulates the actions of every man and which leads men to act in a certain manner from views of advantage. A dealer, okay, in this case the stockbroker, is afraid of losing his character and is scrupulous in observing every engagement. When a person makes 20 contracts in a day, he cannot gain so much by endeavoring to impose to cheat on his neighbors as the very appearance of a cheat would make him lose. So think about that when you interact with your Uber driver or your Lyft driver. They could just drop you off in the wrong neighborhood and there's not much that you could do. But because the system has a reputation mechanism the same way that eBay does, the same way that the London Stock Exchange did, everybody wants to be an upstanding business person. They want to retain business, be upstanding. And it's a poor profit system that encourages this that you don't see uh, among the bureaucrats. Other examples of this, uh, you've got Lloyds of London, Famous, um, famous insurance markets evolved out of Lloyd's Coffee House. In Boston, Shaman Bank used to be Old Exchange Coffee House. In New York, we'll talk about that in a second. Precursor of New York Stock Exchange, Tontine Tavern and Coffee House, Dublin Stock Exchange, Sotheby's Art Markets, Christie's Art Markets, also coming out of coffee houses. In the case of uh, the stockbrokers, they said, we're going to transform this, and also in Lloyd's, this is a picture of Lloyd's of London, they said, we're going to transform these coffee houses into private clubs to create and enforce rules. They said, the law of the land is not enough for all of us, we're going to have our own rules to enforce among members of the club. So if anybody's ever been to a country club or seen a country club, oh, well, there's rules. You can't be poorly dressed in the country club. You can't have your, 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 your arms exposed in the country club. It's a violation of the rules. But they do that to make sure that everybody there is following the rules. And in these stock markets and in these insurance markets, they said, if you want to be a member, you can't default on your contract. They eventually turned these private coffee houses into private clubs. This was called, well, not this one. The, 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 the stock market was called the stock subscription room. And then it was called the stock exchange. And Lloyd's of London's has the exact same history. And I think it was called the room. Okay. Be a member, you have to be upstanding. Make sure you wear the right dress code. New York City, Tontine Tavern and Coffee House. This is right on the western part of Wall Street. And just a few blocks away to the east is now where the New York Stock Exchange is. The Tontine Tavern and Coffee House had a, we could call it, a constitution. My friends, Professor Salter and Professor Young and I always had this debate. I, I don't like that term, constitution. It's confusing to me. 
But these people, literally, private clubs, had a constitution of rules and regulations. If you want to be a member of the Tauntaun Tavern Coffee House, you have to agree to the following rules. No standing on tables. No swearing. No defaulting on your contracts. Those are some of the ones that I can remember. Modern times, this has continued on for the last 150 years years. I'll mention a couple other ones, even more uh, sophisticated markets, and talk about uh, futures exchange. Futures exchange is very interesting. You go to someone and you say, I'd like to make a contract to buy something three months from now. So a lot of airlines will do this. Southwest famously said, we're going to buy our oil for our flights six months in advance. And it's a hedge against risk. If the price of oil goes up, they've already purchased the, the, the contracts. And so it's good for both parties, for Southwest in that case, or the other party who's making the other side of the deal. Okay, maybe they've not made the right choice here, but maybe they've made the right choice there. But at any given moment, somebody else might say, oh, hey, Southwest, I don't remember making that contract. I know I said I'd give you all that oil at the lower price, but now the price is up, I don't remember that. And so these are futures traders. Would you feel comfortable going up to the sky and say, Where my, where's my oil? You just agreed to sell me Southwest all this oil. He's like, no! I don't even wear the right clothing. <laughs> Well, actually, there's this cool thing, and it's called Private Governance. Great book, by the way. You should send it to all of your nieces and nephews. It's my favorite book. When you make a contract at a futures exchange, he and I make this contract, but this is the coolest part. He and I are actually making independent contracts with the House, with the New York Mercantile Exchange, with the Chicago Board of Exchange. We are paying the exchange to assume counterparty default risk. And that guy disappeared. I don't even have to see that person ever again. I have made the exchange with the exchange. He made the exchange with the exchange. And the futures exchange, the commodities exchange, is being paid to manage counterparty default risk. And if he doesn't pay, he's gone. He gets a margin call. And he's kicked out of the club. Everyone who wants to stay in the club has to be a good member of standing. All right, I'll give you a couple more quick examples. I've got two hours. <laughs> two hours, 15 minutes. <laughs> Some really neat things going on in financial markets and uh, this picture of New York, and there's some really amazing things. Asset-backed securities, collateralized loan applicant, uh, collateralized loan, CDOs, and what happens is people bundle a bunch of loans together, and then they slice them up. They say, okay, here's the best ones, here's the worst ones. You can say somebody gets the income first, somebody gets the income last. It's all based on contract. And it's very, very complicated. And when something bad goes wrong, you call the government. No, you do not call the government. You call this great provider of private governance called International Swaps and Derivative Association. They will take your call at any given time of the day when AIG, this very large insurance company, uh, was having difficulty meeting some of its obligations, is this said uh, you've got to up your collateral. Um, in the case of Fannie Mae and Fet Freddie Mac getting nationalized, that was qualified as a credit event. And so rather than everybody yelling at each other, ISTA had a very orderly 
determination of the market price of the value of what Freddie Mae and Freddie Mac owed on their bonds. And then they said to the insurers, here's how much you have to pay out on these things. So very complicated, orderly uh, set of contracts. I've been talking about the financial markets and because uh, I think it's really interesting. But I want to say that this is not just about financial markets. This is all around society. You have all of these private people creating and enforcing rules from people in suits to uh, even uh, people who are actually physically enforcing rules. Most of you have seen, and these ones look a little scary, but examples of private security. If you go to an office building, they'll often have private security in uh, modern times. Uh, this has been around forever. This is a picture of uh, San Francisco during the gold rush. They did not have, uh, basically, there was no government police in the very early times. And so they created these people called the San Francisco Patrol Special Police. And uh, a restaurant would hire them to provide security. There were these roving criminal gangs called the the Sydney Ducks, and they were threatening to burn an entire part of San Francisco. So they hired these people called the San Francisco Patrol Special Police. They're still in the charter of the city of San Francisco. And there was a really bad movie about them with Christian Slater, which I don't recommend. But it is about private police, so that's kind of cool. Here's a recent picture of the San Francisco Patrol special police. I'm going to mention another movie. This is from uh, Netflix. I haven't seen it, so maybe somebody has seen it and can let me know. Uh, but this is a very interesting story. I'm going to get back to modern New York. There is this thing called the Depository Trust and Clearance Corporation. Anybody here owns a stock, any of your parents own a stock, any investment, they're held in, mostly it's electronic these days, an electronic vault of the Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation. And they settle basically all stock transactions. Most of them are all settled electronically since the 1970s. That's just the way it works, it's better. But every once in a while, you'll have, and this is, this is a stock I owned, I still own it, from the 1990s. You used to have physical pieces of paper, and you just put this in your drawer or in your bank. And so this is uh, four shares, learn out in hospital, which is bankrupt. So anyway. <laughs> The reason I mentioned this, most of the time when we trade stocks, there's, it's so liquid and we know, okay, you own a share of Microsoft, it's not a problem, and it's put in this big electronic database. There's a lot of things that are still done on a piece of paper. And so 12 years ago in uh, New York, there was this thing called uh, Hurricane Sandy. And I was living there at the time and I was living in North Carolina as well, but I looked online and I saw a picture of the building next to me getting flooded. And I was like, oh no, New York's getting flooded. So I had to move out for two months. It's a true story. But meanwhile, Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation has most of their stocks in electronic databases, except they had 1.3 million paper certificates in a vault in Water Street in downtown New York. So they come to the vault the next day after the, after the flood. Go down the stairs. Oh no, I think there's some water. Blah, 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 blah. 1.3 million paper certificates floating around <laughs> in dirty salt water with mud and oil and whatever else is in this dirty river water. And the 
depository trust and clear corporation said, okay, we gotta call the cops. <laughs> the cops are here, they're gonna save us. No, no, sorry, they didn't do that. They said, we're gonna provide private governance, private governance. So they got brink trucks to guard. They got freezer trucks to be on the street. They got all these people to take up the sopping wet pieces of paper, put them in freezer trucks. Apparently, when you have frozen paper, it stops deteriorating. And then you can use dry ice to get rid of the water somehow. And that preserves the paper, then you put the chemicals on the paper to make sure it doesn't deteriorate. So they got all these trucks to ship it down to Texas under armed guards by the bricks. So this is a super cool example of private parties solving problems that other people thought didn't know about. So we paid Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation to do this for us without us knowing about it. Now, here's the movie. I haven't seen this. It's fictional, and they said that was a, there was a big heist where there actually wasn't. So this is this new Netflix thing. Has anybody heard about this? I guess it's terrible. <laughs> Don't watch it. I haven't seen it. But apparently in this TV show on Netflix, there are all these bad guys, and they pull off the $60 billion heist. But that didn't actually happen. Because there's private governance. Private rules and regulations. Now, guess who in modern times is heavily invested in new ways of keeping track of certificates, depository trust, and clearing corporation is a big investor in blockchain technology, smart contracts for anybody who follows this, a blockchain, first one was with Bitcoin, and the next big one was with Ethereum, but they're keeping huge amounts of databases to make sure they can try and figure out who owns what. And I've been into Bitcoin for a long time for whatever reason, and I always thought this was a really interesting, neat little thing. But then I remember in 2014, I was chatting with a friend, and uh, uh, my friend worked for Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation, and asked me, what do you think about blockchain? I said, that's so cool. This old, old company is now using this modern technology to make sure people have what they're owed. Um, there's something called a smart contract, and I will wrap up soon, I promise. But a smart contract basically says, here's where somebody owns something, and then if something changes, if conditions X, Y, Z are met, we're going to have the algorithm transfer the certificate from one person to the other party, and it's all settled electronically using algorithms and the blockchains. All right, so I'll, I'll wrap up. The main lesson I want to say is when there's money at stake, private parties like PayPal, all these other ones we've been talking about, have an incentive to make sure that we have what we are supposed to have. And so whenever there's a problem, there's a profit opportunity from solving that. Private governance, private rules and regulations, what I've been talking about today is actually pervasive. Every single one of us here has a contract right now with our cell phone company, our credit card company, and we're hiring them, including arbitration, to make sure we're all happy to have the terms of the agreement met, make sure people are not getting stolen from, overcharged. It's everywhere in history and in modern times. And there's many different types of private rules and regulations that we don't even know about because they're so successful. 
you can deal with people you know, you can deal with honest people, you can have reputation mechanisms. And so when you get in the, into the Uber and the Lyft, you could know that party, it could be a friend, or it could be a random stranger, but as long as the private rules and regulations are working properly, you're going to get there in a safe and fair manner. So I will stop there and just say that even though the government says they're there to help us, they're there to make sure that we're safe. In all cases that I can think of, there are all these private people making sure that everybody has what they want for profit. Thank you very much.